Good morning, my friends. Um, I just want to give a second little shout out to Voice in the Wilderness because I am um, part of my role here as the outreach pastor, Ed Woodland, is to continue developing relationships with our on-site partners. And, um, and I just love getting to know Kilo and, and Juma and their heart is so beautiful and their mission is so stirring. And I just cannot wait to see all the ways that we can continue building a relationship with them. So I really want to encourage you uh, to stop by and say hello to them at the hello desk and get to know what they're doing and, and really prayerfully seek God about how you can be a part of creating God's shalom, wholeness for our friends who are relocating here from the Congo. So we are in the middle of our series called Loose Ends, where we as a community are being brave. We are digging into the scriptures that, that don't make sense. They bring some level of discomfort for us, maybe because they're graphic and they evoke graphic imagery. Or they feel antiquated. They don't fit into our modern 21st century ways of being, ways of thinking. Maybe they challenge the ways that we think about the world. Or maybe they have implications that make us question our faith. And today we're gonna to look at one of those passages. We're gonna look at Mark 4 where Jesus gives an explanation as to why he teaches in parables that feels like it doesn't fit into the, to the whole of the Bible that we as a community have continually talk about. Here at Woodland, we believe that the Bible is a whole story that points to Jesus. And so we are committed as Jesus followers to read the Bible through this Jesus-centered lens. Uh, the, New, the Old Testament points to Jesus, the New Testament reveals Jesus, and then the reflections from the disciples uh, in the rest of the New Testament points back to Jesus. It's, it's all about Jesus, right? But this summer, we're looking at some of those loose ends, those, th those, those passages that, taken out of context, can cause a lot of frustration, a lot of discouragement, because they don't seem to fit in to this whole story that you and I believe points to Jesus. And so today we're going to look at how this loose end can be engrafted into that story and how we don't have to be afraid of it. So I've titled today's sermon, Finding the Word in the words. Finding the word in the words. And it comes from this thought from my friend, uh, Dr. Megan Good, who is the pastor of Trinity Mennonite in Phoenix, Arizona. Pastor Megan says, Christians call the Bible the word of God. The Bible also calls Jesus the word of God. Jesus, the word embodied. God's whole word in flesh. Jesus starts his ministry by clarifying the true intent of all that's come before. You have heard it said in the Old Testament, but I say to you, he sheds light, light on the pages, bringing out the word we sometimes miss in the midst of all the words. So today we're going to find Jesus, our word in the words of today's loose end. When I think of our loose ends, I think of something that typically happens uh, when I am listening to maybe like the sophomore album, the second album of my favorite artist. So the first album, I fall in love with them. I love everything about them. I love the way they write music and I like the style of music and I like their influences and I maybe like their style. Like I love everything about them. And then their second album comes out and these people start taking some creative licenses. <laughs> so in this second album, Maybe the first few tracks remind me of everything I love about them, but then like halfway through, there comes something that is often called an interlude. Now, if you think of an interlude, think of something like Lazing on a Sunday Afternoon from Queen. Okay, so it has like this 1930s radio barbershop quartet feel to it. It sounds nothing like Bohemian Rhapsody, which I totally like. Or think of uh, Beyonce's Lemonade album. Uh, I, I really appreciate Beyonce. I wrote a whole chapter about why her album helped me work, work through racial injustice. Uh, I really appreciated this album, but I did not initially appreciate one track on it called Forward, which was sung by another artist. So first strike Beyonce, I came to listen to you, girl, not this other guy. 
And then second, the, the al- that, that track ends with this weird distortion of voices, and I'm like, this is not the feel-good, happy, bopping in the summer jam that I want from you, Beyonce. This, this forward, this interlude, doesn't fit into the whole of who I know you to be. And it doesn't, in my mind, quite fit into the whole of this album. And that's a little bit how our interludes feel today. They feel like they don't fit into the whole of the story of Jesus. And so you know what I do when I come across one of those interludes? When I decide to shuffle my favorite albums? Uh, I just hit skip. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus, for the iPhone. Just, just hit skip. And I don't have to deal with it. I don't have to deal with all the frustration and the questions that I have, like, why would Beyonce make this choice? Skip. And a lot of times, that's how we feel about our loose ends, right? We just skip right over them. And we pray that when we uh, go to share our faith with our friends, that they don't bring up one of these loose ends, because if they do, we've got nothing. We've skipped. But Woodland, we are going to be brave today. We're not going to skip. We're going to look closely. And we're going to see that this loose end is actually what Billboard magazine calls of the greatest interludes, a connective tissue, something that holds the whole thing together. Because Ford leads into freedom by Beyonce, and freedom I will run to when I have an inkling to run. So today's loose end is going to hold together an important teaching about the parables of Jesus. So if you will look with me at our loose end, It's found in Mark 4, verses 10 through 12. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parable. So that... They may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Wait, hold up, Jesus. Wait, did Jesus just say that he teaches in parables in order to create an us and them dichotomy? Did Jesus just say that he uses parables to intentionally confuse his listeners? Did Jesus just say that he's not interested in forgiveness? He actually doesn't want some people to be forgiven? That doesn't seem like the Jesus I know. That doesn't seem like the Jesus we talk about here at Whitland. That doesn't seem like the Jesus who gave his life on a cross so that everyone could be saved. You know... I got really mad when I read Mark 4 because Jesus was messing with something that was really important to me, his greatest hits, if you will. He was working, he was messing with parables. And y'all, I love the parables. I do. I actually think that sometimes when I'm around other believers, a really fun icebreaker is, tell me your favorite parable and why. It's so great to see what people say. I can look at every major moment in my development as a Christian and point to an aha moment I had in the parables. So if you are telling me, Jesus, that you're messing with my parables, I'm going to get in my feelings because I really want to hold tightly to believe that the parables were this unique, precious, amazing storytelling tactic that Jesus used so that everyone can become saved and all might receive forgiveness. I want to believe that the parables were a way for us to get a glimpse into the kingdom of God and start to embody its ways right here on earth. Don't tell me, Jesus, that you are using parables to confuse people. But that's what our loose end seems to communicate, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at that discomfort that our loose end brings up for us. We're going to look at it because it's important for us to be faithful disciples of Jesus to deal with all of that frustration and ask questions to dig a little deeper. So we're going to look at that frustration. And I'm going to explain to you maybe why 
Jesus taught in parables that has nothing to do with leaving people on the outside, okay? Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it in, and we're going to talk about the specific loose end that we have as it's connected to a parable that Jesus taught. Then we're going to look at his interpretation so that we know what to do when we leave this place, because for me, theology is great, but if I don't have a what now, if I don't know how to take this out, if I don't know how to pray about this on my run, when I run, then <laughs> I'm not going to know what to do with it. And so I wouldn't be serving you well if I didn't give you some next steps. So if you are open to doing that with me, will you join me in prayer? Oh, Jesus. Okay, so first off, Lord, I know you're not messing with my parables. I'm not angry with you about that. I do know that there is something deeper here, and I... As I share with my friends here, Lord, I pray that your spirit illuminates that to all of us. Lord, we know that it is your desire that all men be saved. And we want to find you, Jesus, our word in these words. But we need you. So be in the space, Lord. We invite your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts as only he can. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so what this passage seems to initially be saying when, when I read it was that there are some people who are just doomed because they don't understand parables. It seems to say that, some, that, that Jesus is uh, not throwing open the doors of heaven, but Jesus is using parables as some, some kind of bouncer to heaven. You get this parable, you get it. It seems to say that those of us who do get parables, people like me who look at parables and think they're the greatest thing ever, those of us who do get parables, we have every right to be self-righteous and judge others who don't. It seems to say that, that parables were Jesus's big way of excluding people. And then that was the aim of his ministry while he was here on earth. But if that's the case, then Jesus is some kind of heavenly puzzle master, and he's only looking for the cleverest of us all. If that's the case, then Jesus was cruel because he consistently taught in parables throughout the Gospels in large group settings where he knew that there would be people in that room who would be frustrated who wouldn't get it. And so Jesus, his use of parables was then a very cruel thing because he kept doing it, knowing he was frustrating people, knowing he was creating us and them, outsider and insider. If that's the case, then when Jesus said that he came to be savior of the world, then he was lying. And my friends, we know Jesus is not a liar. Now, some of my friends, some of my believing friends, will soften that discomfort by saying, no, 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 Sheeta, here's the deal. Jesus wasn't a liar. Actually, in fact, what was going on was that God had predestined some people to believe and some to not. And that the reason that Jesus taught in parables was because there's truly insiders and outsiders. And that God has chose, sovereignly chosen some to be damned and some to be saved. And, and you, Oshita, should be so excited because you are one of the ones who were saved. But my friends, I can't live in a world like that. I can't live in a reality where I get to experience the love and joy and shalom of God and people that I love don't because somehow God has chosen them, chosen me and not them. And you know what? As a believer, real talk, it's very easy for me to want to believe that. Because I would want to just say, okay, fine, okay. I mean, I have all these questions, but you know, God's ways are different than my ways. I'm a human, and so I'm just going to let go. And I'm not going to ask any more questions, God. And, and you know, I, I will just have to deal. But then Jesus. But then what do I do 
with all of the things that I see in scripture about the character of Jesus, about the ministry of Jesus. What do I do with all the things that Jesus said about his, himself? in scripture about the aim of his mission is to be inclusive, to say ollie ollie oxen free and all who desire to believe will be saved. What do I do with that? How do I hold these inconsistencies together? And so while it would be easier for me to just say, I'm just gonna go by faith on this one, I can't because I know that God desires me to engage with him with my mind. And so what I'm gonna do right now it's because with a series like this, a loose end series where we're looking at the hard scriptures of, in the Bible and we're really turning our brains on and we're trying to figure out how to engage with that, it's vital that we don't just stop with our minds, but we figure we connect it with our hearts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to, to have a posture of receiving. I'm going to read over you some of the things in scripture that Jesus said about himself or the disciples said about Jesus that seem to counter what our loose end is saying, that Jesus is creating a group of insiders who can then look judgmentally on the outsiders, that Jesus maybe didn't come so that all might be forgiven, that Jesus taught in parables to confuse and frustrate people. So whatever that posture of reception looks like for you, if it's closing your eyes or lifting your hands or just being open or staring right back at me, I, I will stare right back at you. But whatever that posture is, I'm going to read these over you. And as you hear me read them, I want you to ask, do I believe this about God? And I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, is this true about you? So in Matthew, Jesus says of himself, for I am the son of man. The son of man has come to save that which is lost. In John, Jesus says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to the world to judge but to save the world. Jesus says of himself, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The character of God is described in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. And Jesus says about himself when he gives his, when he prepares to give his life for the, on the cross, Jesus says, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Jesus says all these things about himself. Jesus is described as all-inclusive, open arms, eager to bring everyone into the family of God. So many parables, in fact, describe God as an open, fa open armed father who waits and waits and then runs when his son comes. So what is going on here? Something is going on in scripture this loose end needs to be engrafted, so how are we gonna do it? Well, it's super helpful whenever we read something in scripture that we don't quite just get, that we just don't skip over it, that we look at it, but we don't just look at it and reread it and reread it and reread it by itself. We have to read it within its context, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a little bit of context about what was going on in the life of Jesus in his ministry um, that explains why he over, like an overarching answer to possibly why he preached in parables. Then, so this is 30,000 feet above, then we're going to zoom in and we're going to look at our particular loose end and why Jesus chose to quote Isaiah. And then we're going to get practical. We're going to say, what's next? Okay, so at this point in Mark, Jesus had been 
uh, teaching, and his reputation preceded him. He had been teaching, he had been healing, he had been challenging the religious leaders of that time. His disciples didn't fast when everybody else fasted. Um, he healed on the Sabbath. He uh, had table fellowship with a sinner, the tax collector Levi. And so as Jesus is doing these things that garner attention, that are challenging the ways that people thought that a religious leader should be acting, should be teaching, as Jesus was doing this, he was gaining a, a large following. So much so that in Mark, when we pick up in Mark, Jesus steps out, the crowd is so big, he steps onto a boat and he uses the acoustics of the lake to carry his voice over the vast crowd, okay? So imagine with me this huge crowd that Jesus is talking to. I would submit to you that Jesus taught in parables to avoid, because he knew he was under scrutiny. Because in that crowd, yes, there were people who wanted to know who was his Jesus and what was he about. Yes, there were people who were in need of being healed. Yes, there were people who wanted to see it firsthand, but you know who else was in that crowd? The religious leaders. Those who were looking to trap him. Those for whom Jesus was challenging their status, challenging the ways that things always went. So they were there to scrutinize him. And so I, some, some New Testament scholars would say that Jesus taught in parables as a way to communicate the different ways of the kingdom of God, his kingdom, in such a way that would extend his ministry for as long as possible so that he can reach as many, as many people as possible. Because if Jesus came right out and he stepped on that boat, he said, I am the, the rightful king. I have a new kingdom. Thank you very much. <laughs> he, would have, he, he would have been executed, captured and executed almost immediately if he started his ministry that outright, that out, that out front. And so some scholars suggest that his use of parables was a creative way to communicate his teachings in a way to captivate his audience in a way to intrigue those listeners to dig in and get to know and ask a little bit more, but also as a way to avoid that, that to avoid his eventual arrest and um, execution before it was his time. And so that's one reason that I think makes a lot of sense. And it also speaks to that fear that I have that somehow Jesus didn't want everybody to be saved. If Jesus knew that his ministry would be cut short if he was outright, and yet he chose this creative alternative way so that he can engage with as many people as possible, that tells me that Jesus truly wants everyone to be saved, that there is room in the Father's house for every single one of us. So let's look at our loose end for today. So the scripture that we have today, Mark 4, verse 10 through 12, if we have it, we show it on the screen, um, says that the, par the disciples were asking Jesus, why, why do you preach in parables? And Jesus says to them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything has been said in, in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. That they may be ever seeing, never perceiving, ever hearing, never understanding. That harkens back to the prophet Isaiah. Now, what's going on with the prophet Isaiah? Because here's another trick. Whenever Jesus quotes somebody else, we have to go back, we should go back and find out, okay, what is this person saying and what's going on with their life? So when God is speaking this to the prophet Isaiah, it's at a time for the people of Israel where God has been sending prophets over and over and over and over again, and every single time they're saying some variation of repent, your heart is hardened to God. God wants you to come back. Repent, 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 change your ways. And at this point, it seems to be that the more God sends prophets and the more that they hold up 
a mirror to the people of Israel and saying, your heart is hardened. Repent, repent. They dig their feet in even more. And so it seems, so when, when Isaiah says this, when God says this actually to Isaiah, to tell the people, when God says, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven, Jesus is referencing that back, and he is communicating to his crowd that they are just like the people of Israel that they are in a position where they are now hearing from the Lord truth about the conditions of their heart, and that there is a chance, choose to turn. One theologian says, in a commentary I read, Brian Wintel says, he, Jesus, supplemented his explanation by quoting part of God's call to Isaiah. Isaiah has proclaimed God's word to the nation, and the people has had refused to listen. Jesus would have the same experience. So when Jesus is referencing this, the thing that sounds like he is creating an us and them, insider, outsider, when Jesus is saying this, he's actually referencing back, and you want to know what? The people in the audience would remember that, and they would hear it differently. They wouldn't hear Jesus is creating us and them. They would hear, oh, Jesus is like, the, is like Isaiah. He's holding up to us a mirror saying, look at your heart. Change. Change. You know, I had an, exam- I had an experience where something was held up to me, and I had to, to engage with it and check my heart. And it was when I went on a a trip uh, that was specifically geared for racial justice, racial righteousness, called Sankofa. Sankofa comes from the Twi language from Ghana, and it means go back to go forward. So basically, go, it's specifically translated, go back and get it. But the idea is we go back, get the knowledge so that we can go forward. And so this trip was, Sankofa is a a trip where uh, you're paired up, with somebody of another race. So it's a multiracial experience. So I I would be paired up with a white woman. And and the longer one kind of takes the Underground Railroad. But the one I went on was called Mini Sankofa. And so what we did was we started in Kansas at the first home of one of the first abolitionist families um, in the country. And then we made our way to Ferguson where we stood on the spot where Michael Brown, a a black teenager, who was shot by a white police officer who was responding to an armed robbery call, died. And so as a group, we were paired up. Um, because this was a smaller group, we were actually in a group. And, and it was me and uh, a few white sisters and then a Latina sister. And, and so we went on this journey together. And it was intense. They did not let up. We started and we went to the abolitionist home, then we went to an African American museum, and this is where this moment where I had a, an aha about this experience. Our guide, who was nuanced and kind, and who made sure to tell the story of race in America in a way that, that we can see the best of one another, was talking about slavery, and she picked up chains, and she, she asked us to pass it around as a group. And and when they, when they came into my hands, I realized that I was so full of anger and sadness and helplessness. And part of me wanted to blame every other white person in that room for that. And then I passed it to a white friend, and she held it, and she passed it to another friend. And this friend on the bus that afternoon said, when I held those chains, I felt so frustrated because I don't know what to do with this. I don't really think this is a problem, but yet you're telling me this is. And I had nothing to do with this. Those chains didn't change. They didn't magically become something different when it moved from my hands, where I felt sadness and anger, to her hands, where she felt helpless and frustrated, to another friend's hands, who felt mobilized to change, to another friend's hand, who felt something. These chains didn't change. They were what they were. But the condition of our hearts, 
where we were on this journey towards racial justice affected how we viewed the chains. I would submit to you that the parables of Jesus are like that. They don't change. They are what they are. And when we encounter them, they are like a mirror, just like Isaiah's words, just like when Jesus quoted Isaiah. They're a mirror for us to look and say, what is this? What's going on in my heart now that I'm holding these words? How can I find the word of Jesus in these words? And so, while it would seem that Jesus used parables to confuse us, actually, Jesus used parables to help us see so clearly the condition of our heart, which moves us to our next point. Jesus taught the par- the, Jesus ta- uh, taught this. He, he gave his explanation as to why he teaches in parables in relationship to a parable that he taught and then an interpretation of the parable, which, sidebar, if Jesus didn't want people to understand the parables, why would he interpret it? But our loose end is the connective tissue between a parable teaching and then a parable interpretation. I'm not going to go into the parable for you because uh, it's a common one that, we, that we've he- heard in different places. It's the parable of the sower. But for those of you for which this is your first time engaging with the parable of the sower, I'm just going to give you a brief rundown. So there's a, so- there's a sower, and he has seeds because sower sows seeds. And he is scattering them indiscriminately. And the seeds are falling on different types of soil. So some fall on uh, soil that, uh, that, is, that it doesn't have a chance to dig in. It's, it falls on rocks. And so the birds come and take it away. And he throws on the shallow soil. And so it kind of it grows a little bit, but it can't take root because the soil is so shallow. And so uh, when the sun comes, it burns it right up. It scorches it up. Then the, the sower throws it on, and some of the soil uh, are amongst different types of thorns. And because the thorns and this good seed is vying for the same nutritional source, uh, it chokes the life right out of the seed, and it's incapable of producing fruit, incapable of producing a crop. And then there's another type of soil that the sower sows his seeds on. I'll try to say that 10 times fast. The sower sows his seeds on. And that is the good soil. That's the soil where, it's, where the seed is able to go down and take root and produce a crop. And so there is an abundance of flourishing that comes because the, the seed fell on the good soil. So let's go ahead and pick up, starting with our loose end, verse 10. We're going to go through, read our loose end and Jesus' interpretation. So when he was alone... The twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parable, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Others, like seeds sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 60, some 30, some 100 times what is sown. So Jesus teaches about the sower who sows his seed generously as one as, as, and as it lands, once it lands on the soil, the state of that soil determines what happens 
with that seed. So there are two things I want you to pay attention to as we look deeply at the context of our loose end. One, the sower and the seed never change. The chains were what they were. The word of God is what it is. The sower is still good and generous and indiscriminate and hopeful. And the seed, always the good, life-giving word of our Lord. And in this case, in parables. Jesus sowed his word, and the word is the same. Repent, the kingdom of God has come near. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Every parable that Jesus teaches on harkens back to one of these core values. The word doesn't change based on the listener. The word is what it is. The second thing I want you to pay attention to as we talk about our loose end within its context is some soil is ready for the seed and some are not. Some soil is ready for the seeds and some are not. Some hearts are ready for the word. Some of my friends on the Sankofa trip were ready to, to wrestle with racial injustice and some were not. The words of God are like a mirror and it holds up to us and we determine the condition of our heart. We get to say, oh, okay, that stings, Lord. What do you want me to do with that? Or we can say, oh, okay, that stings, Lord. I'm not doing anything with that. So which one are you going to choose, my friends? So it's really empowering when you think about it, that Jesus trusts us so much that he uses parables to engage our curiosity, to captivate our attention, and to invite us to ask more questions. Because if you pay attention to our passage as we read it in context, the 12 and the others that were with them. Oh Lord, I wanna be part of the others. I want to be in that group that sticks around and pays closer attention. You know, one of the things that helps me come to terms with those funky interludes from the artists that I love is when I dig in a little deeper. When I maybe listen to them give an interview where they are promoting the album and they talk about, oh, well, I was influenced by this person and I was reading that and, you know, this really meant something to me. And then I'm like, oh, that Mary Oliver poem that came out of nowhere makes sense now. They've been reading Mary Oliver. And then I go back and listen to the whole album and it makes so much sense and I feel so connected to them and I actually begin to love that artist a little bit more. Or when I go hear them in concert and they're, you know, you know how, how artists do, they're playing their music and talking about, you know, all the things that are going on in their life at that moment and maybe how that song came to be. And they say, well, you know, my mother passed away a while ago and as I was writing this album, and, and she left me a voice message, and so, and I included that on the album because I just wanted you guys to know that, like, I'm moving past grief, and, you know, I love my mom so much, and this is one way that I can honor her on the album. And then I'm like, okay, so that makes sense, why that voicemail came out of nowhere. We have that opportunity, my friends, to dig a little deeper to learn a little more from Jesus, to say, okay, Lord, that makes sense why you quoted Isaiah. I don't want to be ever seeing and never perceiving, ever hearing, never understanding. I want my heart to be good soil because your words are what your words are and you are generous and you desire that all will engage with you. Now, I want to share with you a quick story from when I was a younger believer because this was something that I really struggled with so, as a younger Christian, I was, how would you describe this? Utterly annoying. I was the kind of Christian, I was the kind of young believer that was so excited, but I had a lot of questions. 
There are, why was what I said all the time? Well, why that? Well, why this? Well, why not this? But what about that? Well, you know what? I was reading this the other day, and Lord, I just want to stop and just send a quick prayer for every small group leader I had at that time. I know I was a hot mess. But one of the things that I struggled with the most in that season was feeling a sense of shame because I continually asked questions. And that's why I love this church community so much, because we are a community of people who ask questions. Because you know what? As I was coming to terms with this part of me that would just not give up, that would wrestle with God, I came across a scripture in Luke where God just set me free and actually invited me to ask questions. Luke 10, 27 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I realized that as much as I really wanted to share the gospel and love others, unless I first came to, came to terms with the fact that I was a questioner and that God loved me as a questioner and that I actually was a, a source of delight to engage with God with all of myself, my heart, my soul, my strength, and my mind, then I could not love others from an authentic place. And so my friends, as I close, I want to encourage those of you that want to ask questions, know that you are in good company. You are amongst friends. Ask your questions of us and the Lord. They're not offensive. And they may feel like funky, weird interludes to you, like where does this come from? They're not. They're music to the ears of our Lord. For those of you that want to pay attention to the condition of your heart, I am encouraged and I'm grateful. And I say, keep at it. Keep peering at your heart and being sensitive. And keep reading the parables because I will ask you in a public setting what your favorite parable is. <laughs> because Jesus taught in parables to his followers because he wanted them to think and access the state of their hearts. He wanted to intrigue them about the alternative ways of the kingdom of God. He wanted to inspire them to practice it in their everyday lives. And this is our calling as kingdom people. When we encounter a passage that feels like a funky, weird interlude, maybe it sounds like a record scratch to our ears, that we don't skip over it, that we engage with it, that we love the Lord with our whole mind and that we use our curiosity to draw closer to him he loves it because Jesus interpreted it, his parables for his disciples and the others. Never give up and never believe that you're on the outside. Jesus died to secure our place at his feet so that we can be like Mary and choose the better portion. So let us learn and listen and grow. And as we do, we will find the word within the words. This is good news for so many of, of us who worry that we have to have everything figured out. We don't. We have our good teacher, Jesus, with us. So let us continue to be brave and curious. Then let us promise always, always, to hold on to what we know of our word, Jesus, as we are parsing out the words of our loose ends. And so I want to encourage those of you who need prayer for anything. Maybe today's sermon touched something in your heart and you would need prayer. You would like to be encouraged. I want to invite the prayer team to come up and be prepared to receive you. Please know that we love you and we want to pray for you. So please avail yourself to this. Go in peace to love the Lord with all of your heart. Yes, and all of your soul. Yes, and all of your strengths. Yes. But love the Lord with your mind. And go out embodying the new ways of our kingdom, of the kingdom of God that are taught in parables. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.